Hey, Brother Roy here, Old School Bible Baptist Ministries. Listen, uh, sometimes people will read uh, the book of Hebrews and think uh, that the book of Hebrews teaches that you could lose your salvation. What does it teach? Let's take a look, but let's pray first. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you, thank you for our salvation. Thank you for the blood. We thank you for your Holy Bible, which we ask you now to help us to rightly divide in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so the, uh, uh, the, two, the two places in Hebrews uh, that give a lot of folks a lot of trouble is Hebrews chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 10. So let's take them in order. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 6 first. Because people that teach that you can lose your salvation, uh, they love to run right here to these passages in the book of Hebrews. All right. So beginning in the first verse of Hebrews chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open, open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Okay, so, first of all, we talk about rightly dividing. And what's rightly dividing? Rightly dividing is discerning what is being spoken to who, when, and under what circumstances. Uh, it basically applying context to the verse or passage. You can't just rip a verse or passage out of its context and apply it. It loses all meaning. There's that the, we don't do the Bible like the horoscope or a Ouija board and just close our eyes and go, okay, oh, you might as well just go to the horoscope in your daily paper. That's not the way the Bible works. That is witchcraft. We study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, so we get into Hebrews chapter 6, right? And um, let's notice some things. Number one, we get into uh, um, verse 2. And as he gets to the end of verse 2, he's talking about all these doctrines. And then in verse 3, he says, and this will we do, okay? So we're going to notice here, a contrast between us and them, all right? Or we and they. Watch. Verse 4, for it is impossible for those, okay? Not we, those, all right? So now we're looking at two different people. For those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to, go, to come. If they, not we, see, this will we do, but this is those and they, they shall, verse six, if they shall fall away to renew them again 
unto repentance. So there's a contrast here between us and we and they and them. There's two two totally different groups of people being addressed here. Uh, so then uh, uh, he, when he gets uh, uh, into verse uh, eight, he says, but that which beareth thorns is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. He says, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. So we're talking about those that are burned and the we. So there's them and there's we. Notice also the end has come into it. And as we read down a little bit in verse 10, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that what every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto what the end and that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit what the promises. So we're talking here. It's a group of people, them that is not us. Okay. And they are what they are. They are coming to the end and they are holding on to something unto the end. What? Well, this, this is familiar language, okay? Here's where rightly dividing comes in. This is where knowing your Bible comes in. This is where context comes in. This is familiar language. Where, 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 do, where did we hear this about the end and, and the hope under the end, under the end, under the end? Maybe Matthew chapter 24? Uh, maybe, maybe Matthew chapter 24 would put the context to Hebrews chapter 6? Well, let's, let's look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And uh, starts in verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things, these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of what? The end. <laughs> the end of the world, right? So Jesus goes and says, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Take that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many, and you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But what? The end. The end is not yet. And he goes on and he tells, talks about what's going to happen at the end and what's going to happen at the end. And he gets to verse 13. He says, and he says, but he that endureth that in, that shall endure unto what the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. And then shall what the end comes. All right. And what are we talking about? When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Amen. What, what, what is the end? The end is the tribulation. Jesus Christ is describing Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation. All right. So now, whoa, it's making a whole lot more sense. What Paul is saying over here. In Hebrews, he's talking to what? Who was the book ad addressed to? Hebrews. He's talking to a bunch of Jews who are in the tribulation. That's why he says, the end, the end, endure unto the end. So Hebrews chapter 6, what happens? Hebrews 6, he says, For it is impossible, verse 4, for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they, not us, they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open 
shame. So Paul is saying that in, in the tribulation, it, right before the end, which has been identified in the passage, uh, that there is a way that you can fall away. And if you do fall away, it's impossible to renew them under repentance. So this is, this is a falling away that you can't get right. You can't change your mind. You can't go back. You can't repent. You can't get back under the blood of Jesus. This is, this is a falling away that's permanent, a severing. Amen. And, and, and where does that happen? Well, it happens in the tribulation. Look at Revelations chapter 14. Revelations chapter 14, verse 10. And the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night. Who what? Who worship the beast and the image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that what? Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is in the tribulation. If somebody takes the mark of the beast in the tribulation, uh, uh, <laughs> there is no way to renew them unto repentance. Because what? Look at verse 12. They have to what? Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Why? Because the tribulation is Daniel's 70th week. The tribulation is the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the time that God finishes his business with the Jewish people. It's the wrapping up of the program that God has, the prophetic Old Testament program to the nation of Israel. So what happens? They go back under a faith and works economy in the tribulation. They don't get born again like we are. Now, it's, it's different than Old Testament salvation because Old Testament salvation, they didn't get fully saved. They had to go wait in Abraham's bosom until Jesus paid for their sins. And then they, he was able to lead captivity captive and take them to heaven. They couldn't go to heaven until their sins were taken away. But see, now the, now that sin has been taken out of the way, the Jews in the tribulation, they don't have to go to Abraham's bosom. When they die, they go straight to heaven. But see, they, they have to die in faith. And when they die in faith, then the blood of Jesus is applied to them and they go straight to heaven. That's in the tribulation. See, that's what's different between tribulation salvation and Old Testament salvation. But because we've gone out of this dispensation, salvation in this dispensation, the body of Christ, the church age, we get born again, bam, the moment we believe. It goes back because God's gone back to dealing with the Jews. They don't get saved the same way we get saved. They have to what? We just read it. They have to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They have to not take the mark of the beast. They have to what? Endure unto the end of the tribulation. They have to remain faithful unto the end. And that's why all of that comes together with Revelation and Matthew and Hebrews. And you see what's happening. Hebrews chapter six is not us who are Christians saved and born again in, in this dispensation. It's them. It's they. It's the Jewish people during the tribulation period in the time of the end, and they can't take the mark of the beast, or there's there's no going back, and it's done, and they're damned. And uh, so that's what he, he, he talks about, the burning of them. Back there in R Hebrews chapter 6, uh, look at... Uh, Verse 8, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose what? End is to be burned. When they burned at the end, all right? Well, look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 12. Matthew 3, here's, listen, listen, here's what John the Baptist said when he came on a scene. He says, uh, I indeed baptize you, verse 11. 
I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with what? Fire. What? Whose span is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. When is that? At the end. <laughs> That's what he's talking about right here. Verse 8, Hebrews 8, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected is nigh unto cursing, whose what? End is to be burned. We're talking about a period of time that has an end that's called the tribulation, and it's for Hebrews. Amen? And one more, Matthew chapter 13. Jesus doubles down at two or more witnesses. This is what Jesus says. Uh, so shall it be at what? The end <laughs> of the world. The angels shall come forth to sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Context. You put all that together and Hebrews 6 explains itself. But if you just pull Hebrews 6 out of its context, try to apply it to a Christian in the church age, you're going to be confused. You're going to be a workman that does need to be ashamed because you haven't rightly divided the word of truth. Amen. Little Bible, just being a little familiar, familiar with your Bible and believing your Bible and applying context and rightly dividing your Bible will always clear up any seeming contradiction. Okay. The next one, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10 and. Uh, Let's start in verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and done despite under the spirit of grace. But we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. All right. So ripping that out of its context, <laughs> if, and you say, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there are made no more sacrifice for sins. What they're saying <laughs> that uh, uh, after, after I got saved, if I ever sin willfully uh, after I got saved, uh, that uh, uh, I lost my salvation. Is that, is that, is that what it's saying? That's what some people teach that it's saying. But if that happens to be the case, uh, it would also be teaching you can't get it back because <laughs> there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. So in other words, the first time you sin willfully after you were saved, then you lost your salvation and can't get it back. If, that's, if you want to try to apply this to a uh, born again child of God in the body of Christ in the church age, in this dispensation, if you want to try to apply that verse to us that way, now that's what it's saying. But that's not what it's saying. That's what it's saying when you don't apply the context and read the context. So let's go back into the context again. Who was being spoken to? Hebrews. The whole book is addressed to Hebrews, right? And so what is what has he said? Getting the context, working our way up to this verse. Let's get the context. He says, uh, verse 11 of uh, chapter 9, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things, to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal 
redemption for us. See, that's what we're talking about. And, and it comes on here in verse 22, and almost all things by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood, it, there remains no sacrifice for sins. And uh, then he gets down to uh, chapter 10. Uh, he says, verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Uh, and every high priest standeth daily ministering and offering uh, uh, oft times the same sacrifice which can never take away sin. But look at verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. Amen. Verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Amen. Verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Amen. So when we get over to uh, verse 26, now we now 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 read it again, having applied the context. The whole first part of the conversation will open up this latter part of the conversation. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. What was the knowledge of the truth? That the blood of bulls and goats don't work anymore. That Jesus Christ has come and he has paid that one final offering forever sacrifice for sin. That's the knowledge of the truth. So we're talking to Hebrews and we're saying, listen, if we Jews, if we sin after that, we have found out about Jesus and that one final sacrifice, what there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. That means there's no more blood of bulls. There's no more goats. There's no more temple. None of that's any good anymore. See how it just opened up when you applied, when you applied the context to it and but a certain fearful looking forward to of judgment and fiery indignation. Because why look? Verse 29, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall be he thought worthy, who hath what trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and done despite under the spirit of grace. So what's he saying? He's saying that if you're a Jew, and you've heard that the blood was shed for you and what Jesus did for you, and you try to go back to the blood of bulls and goats and temple sacrifice, uh, you have you have trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith you the sanctified an unholy thing. That is the context of Hebrews chapter 10. It in no way, shape, or form teaches that a born-again believer in this dispensation, in the age of grace, in the body of Christ, could ever lose his salvation. We've looked at Hebrews chapter 6. We've looked at Hebrews chapters 10. And maybe in future videos, we'll address some of the other scriptures that are taken out of context and not rightly divided that people try to use when they teach that you could lose your salvation. Listen, you're born again. You cannot be unborn. You can't undo what God did. You didn't save yourself. You can't unsave yourself. Uh, it's If it was, was an eternal life, <laughs> then it, if you could lose it, it wouldn't be eternal. Amen. So uh, I once saved, always saved by grace through faith, 100%. That's the difference between biblical Christianity and every religion in the world. And every error, they say you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, and we all week, all week say is thank you because it was done, it is done, it is finished. We trust the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, and we receive the free gift of salvation, and we're instantly born again and seated in heaven, heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and that's eternal security. That's a permanent salvation that cannot be done. You've become a member of the body of Christ. He dwells in you. He lives in you. You're part of his body. And for, in order for a Christian, a born again believer in this dispensation to go to hell, a little piece of Jesus Christ would have to go to hell because you are 
members of his body. Stand strong, rightly divide. We'll see you again in the next one.